video you're about to see is by Charles Caps on um, how to succeed where others have failed. It tells how God led him through a series of events um, how to, and showed him how to use the Word to have amazing success pretty much all the time with miracle after miracle after miracle. Great stories and great teaching. Uh, here comes the video. Well, say this with me. I'm a believer. I'm not a doubter. I believe God. I believe His Word. I trust God. And what I trust about God is His Word. Thank you, Father, for Your Word, for Your truth, for Your Word is truth. Circumstances lie, but Your Word is truth. And I'll follow Your Word. Hallelujah. All right, open your Bibles again tonight. We're, we're talking about, we started this morning, just kind of introduced the subject. Um, I used the, the title, actually, we're talking about doing the sayings of Jesus, but how to succeed when others fail. Now, there's failure on every hand, but how to succeed when others fail. And we read from the sixth chapter of Luke, and I want to read the, the foundation scriptures again tonight as we share this with you. <clears throat> In Luke, the sixth chapter, beginning with verse 46 or 45. A good man out of the good treasure of his heart bringeth forth that which is good. An evil man out of the evil treasure of his heart bringeth forth that which is evil. For out of the abundance of the heart the mouth speaketh. And why call ye me Lord, Lord, and do not the things which I say? Whosoever cometh to me and heareth my sayings and doeth them, I will show you to whom he is like. He is like a man which builds a house, dig deep, laid the foundation on a rock. And when the flood arose and the stream beat vehemently upon that house and could not shake it, for it was founded upon a rock. But he that heareth and doeth not is like a man that without foundation built his house upon the earth against which the stream did beat vehemently, and immediately it fell, and the ruin of that house was great. Now, as I said this morning, you realize he's not talking about a housing project at all. He's talking about individual lives. He says three things that will cause you to be successful in life. But you must put all three of them together. Come to me, hear my sayings, and do them. Now, the foundation here is doing the sayings of Jesus. He laid the foundation on the rock. In other words, everything that he did was based on the Word of God. Jesus is the rock, and Jesus was the Word of God. So he based what he did on God's Word, not on circumstances or situations, but he believed God's Word. Everything that he did, he did it because of the Word. Didn't do it because someone else did it. Now, someone else may have done it and may have missed it. But you do it because of what God said. So there's three things. You come to Jesus, you, do his, you hear his sayings, and you do them. Now, as I said this morning, sometimes people get the idea that, well, now one of these people, one of these individuals was saved and the other wasn't. But I, I'm convinced that both of them could have been full gospel, tongue-talking, Bible-toting, full gospel businessmen. <laughs> They both came to Jesus. They both heard what Jesus said, but only one of them did what Jesus said. And when the storms and the stream of life, the storms of life, began to come against the one that only heard, immediately he fell. But did you notice what Jesus said about the other? He said, if you hear my sayings and do it then, it could not shake it. The storms of life can't shake it. Inflation can't shake it. Recession can't shake it. 
because God has made provision. Now, you know, you, you listen to the news media, and, and if you go, you know, if you analyze the Bible in the light of the 6 and 10 o'clock news, you're in trouble. <laughs> but analyze the 6 and 10 o'clock news in the light of the Word of God. Jonah said something that stands out very vividly in my thinking for years, and he says, They that observe lying vanity forsake their own mercy. Lying vanity. In other words, it looked like it was true. It looked like he was doomed. But in that fish's belly, he said, <laughs> this came to him evidently. If I accept this, I'm done for. Well, you know the story. God provided the big fish not to punish Jonah, but to save his life. And a Sunday school teacher said to her Sunday school class, and they studied Jonah, said, uh, what does this story teach us? But the boy raised his hand and said, all right, what, Johnny, what does it teach us? It teaches us that people make whales sick. <laughs> Well, see, you could miss the whole point altogether. <clears throat> but now notice, he said, doing the sayings of Jesus. Well, now let's back up here just a little bit and talk about some of the things Jesus said to do. If you'll notice uh, that Jesus, beginning here with about verse uh, 27, But I say unto you, which here, love your enemies, do good to them that hate you, bless them that curse you. Pray for them that despitefully use you. You know, that's a little bit against human nature, isn't it? But remember what he said, if you don't do the sayings of Jesus, you're going to fail in life. See, we've got to decide that if this is true, then I need to do it. And you have to make a decision. You don't feel like doing it. I mean, you'd like to bless them with a brick. <laughs> like one, one lady was counseling with the counselor and uh, pastor and said, uh, well, her husband just means that they're just, you know, just having all kinds of problems. Well, she, he said, uh, have you tried heaping coals of fire upon his head? <laughs> you know, Paul said, do good to those that do evil. But by this, you'll heap coals of fire upon his head. She said, well, no, she said, I haven't tried that, but I did pour hot scalding water on him. <laughs> well, there again, she missed the point, didn't she? But now, this is what Jesus said to do. Now, remember, Jesus is a prophet. He said, if, if, if you don't do my sayings, you're going to fail in life. So you just don't drift through life and just do what you feel like doing You make a decision to love your enemies. It, you don't do it because you feel like doing it. God didn't send his son and, and give his life, sacrifice his son because he felt like doing it. He did it because he made a decision to do it. God is love. Notice in verse 30, Give to every man that asketh of thee and of, of him that taketh a uh, way thy goods, ask them not again, or ask for, don't ask for them back. <laughs> Somebody said, what's that talking about? Talking about Clinton's tax bill, I guess. <laughs> yeah. Well, why not apply to that? Give it to him, believe for a return. See, sometimes we get upset over taxes. Notice what he goes on to say here. And, and if you, and as you would that men should do unto you, do also to them likewise. Well, drop on down here a ways. I'd like to take time to go through all these. But verse 35 says, But love ye your enemies, and do good, and lend, hoping for nothing again. Well, that'd certainly apply to taxes, wouldn't it? <laughs> and your reward shall be great and ye shall be the children of the highest. Look at verse 38. Give, and it shall be given unto you. Good measure, pressed down, shaken together, running over. Shall men give unto your bosom. 
For with the same measure that ye meet with all, it shall be measured unto you in. Give, and it shall be given. Now this is a saying of Jesus, isn't it? I mean, if Jesus said it, it's a saying of his. So you see, that there's a lot of things in here that if we would learn to make decisions on and decide that I'm going to do what Jesus said to do. Now, I want to share with you some of my, some of my testimony. I, I hardly ever do this because I don't want you believing in just in testimonies or what I uh, believe in it because I did it. But yet, Oral Roberts said something to me one time. He said, don't ever quit sharing these experiences because these illustrations are windows that people see through. Now, when I began to see that if I don't do the sayings of Jesus, I'm going to fail in life. I was sick in body, head over heels in debt. Uh, the doctor said I had an ulcer form, uh, beginning in the esophagus. Be laid up for three days at a time, drink that Maalox by the bottle. Dear God, thank God I'm redeemed from Maalox. <laughs> but you see, I got a hold of some tapes from Brother Kenneth Hagin about redeemed from the curse of the law and some tapes on confession. And I'll tell you what, I went to church every time the doors were open. I went to a full gospel church. But I never heard one sermon on Mark 11, 24 or 23 uh, that you can have what you say. Now, they talk the best they knew of what they knew. But folks, if you go to the wrong church, you may die young and love God with all your heart. You can't believe any further than you have knowledge. So I began to hear some things that hadn't been taught in my church. My first reaction was, now, if that's true, they'd have taught that in my church. But they didn't know anything about that in my church. But yet there was nothing wrong with the church other than they just didn't have the revelation of some of these things. You understand what I'm saying? But I decided that if Jesus said it, it must be true, and if I'm going to fail if I don't do it, I'm going to start doing it, because I was already failing. I was already successful in the failing part. <laughs> so I just simply started confessing the scriptures. I remember one day I was praying, and, and it takes you a while to get rid of some of this stuff that you learned over the years. It's harder to unlearn than it is to learn some things. And I was praying one morning. I said, Lord, I prayed it's not working out. Things are getting worse. And the Spirit of God spoke up on the inside of me. I didn't hear a voice. He said, who told you that? And it shocked me. And I thought for a minute, I said, it must have been the devil, because you sure didn't say it, did you? <laughs> no, and he said, I'd appreciate it if you'd quit telling me what the devil said. <laughs> and I realized, I've been quoting the devil more than I was quoting God. He said, now, you didn't pray to me to do something about your finances. And he said, uh... If you don't change your confession and what you're saying daily, it, it won't get any better. It's going to get worse. Because he said, you're quoting what the devil says. You're in faith cometh by hearing. And I'll tell you, I had all the words I wanted. I'm ready to change. But I mean, when you come to the point I was, I was la hanging at the last knot at the end of the rope. You've seen this cat, you know, hanging on this rope right at the end that says, hang in there, baby. <laughs> I was just barely hanging in there. And brother, when I heard this message, I said, that's, that's it. If you really want to know the truth, when you hear it, you'll know it instantly. If you don't want to know it, you wouldn't know it if it came down the street with a red hat on. <laughs> Jesus said, he that hath ears to hear, let him hear. He that hath not shall be taken away from him, even that which he hath. Talking about ears to hear. But now, I got a hold of this faith and confession message through, through books and tapes. And I just simply decided I'm going to say what God said regardless of what, what else happens. In fact, uh, the Lord said to me, it, when he said, it's going to get worse, it's not going to get any better, you don't change what you're saying. I said, well, what am I going to do? 
He said, well, go through the Word of God and write down what I said about your finances and your situation in life. And begin to confess it day after day after day. Write it down. And that's how this little book, God's Creative Power, started. On a yellow sheet of paper, handwritten, folded and put in my shirt pocket, I'd go back on the back side of the farm every morning, walk up and down the turn row, and confess, I am the body of Christ. The enemy have no power over me to overcome evil with the good. I am of God and have overcome the wicked one. For greater is he that's in me than he that's in the world. I will fear no evil, for thou art with me. Your words, your spirit, they comfort me. I'm far from oppression. Fear does not come nigh me. No weapon formed against me will prosper. Whatever I do will prosper. For I'm like a tree planted by the rivers of water. I'm delivered from the evils of this present world. For it is the will of God concerning me. No evil will befall me. Neither shall any plague come nigh my dwelling. And on and on. There's abundance and no lack. And every time I'd get to that, and there's abundance and no lack. Boy, there was a religious thing that come up, you know. And my old religious head said, you're just lying. <laughs> and I stopped one morning. I said, Lord, I just, it just seems to me like I'm lying saying this. <laughs> and I'll never forget what the Spirit of God said to me. Just as real, I wouldn't have been any stronger if he'd have said it over a microphone or a loudspeaker. He said, son, how could you lie saying what I said about you? See, Psalms 1, 3, shall be like a tree planted by the rivers of water. Well, what's that mean? I knew what it meant because, see, I like to fish down there on the White River. And those old cypress trees along the lakes, the dry summer that comes, they just demand from that lake and that river all they need. The leaf also shall not wither, whatsoever it doeth shall prosper. So I continue to confess the Word of God. Now here's the thing that most people have not understood. There's a lot of triers of the Word, but not many doers. Sometimes people will start confessing things, and they'll, they'll confess it two or three days, and they say, well, I confessed it three days, and it didn't work. Folks, I confessed it a week, I confessed it a month, I confessed it two months, I confessed it three months. Now, after the first week or so, I could tell a difference in my attitude and what I believed. You can change what you believe by what you say. See, you've been believing what you say all the time. Now, other people can spark you in believing in a direction, but what you're saying yourself is going to really be what you believe. The more you say it, the more you'll believe it. The more you confess the negative things, the more they'll be engrafted into your spirit. But I spent weeks and months confessing the Word of God. And when I'd say there's abundance and no lack, so many times everywhere I looked there was lack. But I'm not going to observe lying vanity. See, that was, there was lack. That was a, a present fact in my life. I didn't deny it. But yet, I didn't, I didn't give place to it. I called it the way God called it. He said, if I give, it'll be given unto me. If I sow bountifully, I'll reap bountifully. Well, I had done that. So far as I was concerned, I'm going to say what God said about it until I receive what God said I'd have. So I continued. See, there was no turning back because, I mean, I, <laughs> the last knot at the end of the rope is no way to go but up. <laughs> After about three months of confessing, I am healed with the stripes of Jesus. Thank God I'm redeemed from the curse of the law. The ulcer disappeared. <laughs> now it tried to come back. I remember one day I was fishing on White River, and that pain hit me right there, and I started to say, I thought I was healed, but I guess I'm not. And I remembered Brother Hagin talking about that, that it says that's, that's how people, a lot of people lose their healing. And I just slapped myself right there. I said, stop that in the name of Jesus. I'm healed by the stripes of Jesus. Just as quick as you can snap your finger, it left. Two or three times I had to do that. In fact, I, I did that one time I was teaching. 
right in the middle of the teaching session. I just slapped myself and said, stop that in the name of Jesus. I don't know what the people thought. I never did explain it. I mean, you could get sidetracked, you know, but I'll tell you one thing, my body obeyed me. Now, see, it was over a period of time. Now, see, people, uh, when you go to teaching this way, uh, uh, people say, well, you know, well, I, I'm going to believe God that way. Now, you know, if the doctor says you've got something, if you don't have an operation in 10 days, you're going to be dead, that's not time to start confessing. <laughs> they say, they write me all the time, say, do you think I should have an operation? The doctor says, you know, that I have cancer. So, Certainly, have an operation. The very fact that you had to ask proves that you're not in a position to believe God in that matter. So you've got to be fully persuaded. Don't ever push people out there beyond where they're developed to. You're going to have a funeral on your hand. But see, don't hinder people's faith either. But you see, the Word of God will build your faith. Now, over a period of time, you see, that happened. Built me to the point. Now, over the next year then, I confess the Word of God daily. Just saturate yourself with the Word of God. And, and uh, I can relate to the, the farmer talking about listening to tapes on his tractor. I, I spent hours, uh, seven, eight hours a day in a pickup truck. Tapes going all day long. It wasn't uh, Brother Hagin or somebody, it was the New Testament on tape. Just saturate yourself with the Word of God. You don't realize how that changes you. The Word of God is powerful. But, you see, over a period of time, that built into my spirit. Now, I remember the day that it began to become, I became fully persuaded. It's been about a year. I was saying, thank God I have abundance and no lack. And all of a sudden, I said, glory to God, I do, don't I? There's abundance and no lack. Now, I didn't have a bit more money than I did six months before. But there was an emotion that came over me. I felt the same as I feel now when I don't have any financial problems. And brother, I was deep in, if I'd sold everything I owned, I'd still owe you know, including the pants I had on, I'd still owe a hundred thousand dollars. What happened? I became fully persuaded. Now, after I became fully persuaded, you see, see, God's Word produces the faith for things that God has given us. Faith cometh from what? Hearing. And hearing, and hearing, and hearing the Word of God. Now, Jesus said, out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaketh. The good man, out of the good treasure of his heart, he brings forth good things. But you see, people don't want to take the time to put the good treasure in there. They want it to be a fast service, you know. I'm going to get it tonight. No, you, did, you didn't get that doubt and unbelief that way. It came a little at a time. You confess the Word of God, you confess the Word of God until faith comes. He didn't say faith comes by having heard, or faith came by having heard. Faith comes by hearing, and hearing, and hearing, and hearing. Now, if you study what the Apostle Paul taught about that in Romans, the 10th chapter, he said, the righteousness which is a faith says, the Word is nigh me, it is in my mouth and in my heart. Now, notice, didn't say it's in your neighbor's mouth and in your heart, it says it's in your mouth and in your heart. Didn't say it's in your pastor's mouth and in your heart. It's in your mouth and in your heart. Now, the reason I'm spending so much time on this is because I want to lay the foundation, because so many times people get the idea uh, when I begin to give illustrations, well, bless God, I'm going to try that. Now, if you're just going to try it, uh, you're going to fail. You've got to do the foundation first. You've got to be doing what the Word says You've got to base your faith on God's Word. You've got to be fully persuaded of what you're doing. Now, I don't know. It never occurred to me that it might not work. Never, never crossed my mind. 
I saw Jesus said it, so I'm just going to do it until it works. I don't know how long it'll take for you to get the good treasure in your heart to where it's abundantly in your heart, because you see, until it gets abundantly in your heart, you're not going to affect much by your saying in changing things. But you're going to change yourself by what you say. You're going to change what you believe. See, what you believe today is because of what you've confessed in days past. Because what you say, remember what Paul said, is in your mouth and in your heart. The word is not you. What word? The word of faith. It's in your mouth and in your heart. So then, after a year or so, I began to see the things that I said change situations. Now, I gave you an illustration this morning that uh, I, I had some mortgages on a piece of property. I took them out and, see, turn there to Luke, the 17th chapter. Jesus speaking of the disciples in verse 5, the apostles said unto the Lord, increase our faith, Luke 17, verse 5. And the Lord said, if you had faith as a grain of mustard seed, you might say unto the sycamine tree, be thou plucked up by the root, be thou planted in the sea, and it should obey you. If you had faith as a seed. Say to it. Now, we're not talking about moving a tree. No more than we're talking about housing projects over there. We're talking about problem areas that's in your life. If, if you back up and study the context of this, talk about unforgiveness. Talk about forgiving people. So you would say to unforgiveness, you're a thing of the past. You'll never hinder me again. You're plucked up and cast into the sea, planted in the sea, not cast into. You just cast it in a tree in the sea, and you want to do it, wash it right up on shore. You have to deal with it again. Jesus tells you how to eliminate it. Be plucked up, be planted in the sea, and it should obey you. Who's it going to obey? You, not God, you. What you're saying about it is what's going to happen. And you know what most people say? Well, you just don't know what they did to me. I just can't forgive them. I tried, but I can't. See, those that say they can and those that say they can't are both right. Amen. Because, see, you're establishing. Now, Jesus said we're going to fail if we don't do his saying. He says, you had faith as a seed, you would say. That's what it begins with, with the saying. Now, it won't happen. Now, listen to me closely. It won't happen just because you say it. But if you have faith as a seed, then what kind of faith does a seed have? <laughs> the seed has faith in the ability. The DNA on the inside of it knows how to do it. God's Word in you has the DNA of God in it, the building blocks of life. It knows how to do it. You don't have to pray over, uh, a farmer doesn't have to pray over his corn, his seed corn so he'll know what to do when he plants it. It's already established in that seed. If you have faith as a seed, he said, you'd say. Well, now, why is it that people talk so negative? They have faith as a seed. Well, I can already see this. It's not going to work. Self-talk will defeat you. And I'm not talking about just everything you say out loud. You talk to yourself every day. You know, things start going wrong some morning, and, and you haven't said a word, but here's what's going through your mind. It's self-talk. I can already see this day is going to be a mess, going to be a bummer. <laughs> self-talk. It'll defeat you in life. Now, Jesus said, and let me allow me to use it here. He said, take no thought by saying. What shall we eat? What shall we drink? Wherewith shall we be clothed? Now, see, people get that idea. Well, Jesus said, don't ever take any thought. No, that wasn't what he said at all. He said, take no anxious thought by saying. Because when you take thought by saying, what are we going to do? That's a seed of doubt. Don't no, take thought by saying, I know what I'm going to do. I'm going to confess God's word till faith comes. Don't take thought by saying. Now, in the fourth chapter of Mark, you find that he says, the things that Satan uses to get the word out of you. Now, it's interesting what he says. Turn over there to Mark's fourth chapter.
verse 17. And it says, They have no root in themselves, so endure for a time. Afterwards, when affliction and persecution arises for the word's sake, immediately they are offended. We talked to a fellow at Mayo Clinic. Tried to talk to him about God's willingness to heal and deliver. And the things would be right. He had said, well, you know, I just said that, you know, if my wife dies while she's here, why, well, that's just the will of the Lord. And we tried to share with him, hey, God wants your wife well. And started quoting some scripture and, and sharing with him, and he got offended. He got offended at the word. His wife had a heart attack during the transplant. But she did pull through. But anyway, notice what it says here. And these are they which are sown among thorns, such as hear the word, the cares of this world, deceitfulness of riches, lust of other things, entering in, choke the word. And folks, here's the key right here. They won't enter in if you don't cause them to enter in. How do they enter in? Paul tells you in Romans the 10th chapter, the word is now you, it is in your mouth and in your heart. What you speak out of your mouth enters into what the Bible calls the heart. That's the way you get the word of God in there. That's the way you get fear in there. Faith cometh by hearing. How does fear come? Same way, by hearing. Just hearing a different thing. Now, Jesus said, the word is nigh you, or Paul said, the word is nigh you, in your mouth and in your heart. These things enter in, choke the word. They enter in by speaking things that are contrary to the word of God. Now, I know that when you, you start talking to pieces of paper, talking to ground, people look at you strange. They'll give you lots of room. <laughs> <laughs> but I got a hold of this, and I began to see it. I began to, and the more I taught it, the more revelation I got. The entrance of the word bringing light. I had two two houses out on this project that I had built, and and they hadn't sold. And I, I was praying one morning. I said, Now, Lord, I I prayed and believed you for a buyer. I want to know why these houses hadn't sold. He said, Why don't you do what you've been teaching? I said, You mean talk to them? Well, that's what I've been teaching. You'll have what you say. And I was saying, Lord, the houses hadn't sold. And they hadn't. See, you can be that close to the revelation and miss it all together. And so, so I, I remembered then what the Lord said. If you don't do my sayings, you're going to fail. He said, if you had faith as a seed, you would say. And here I am saying they're not sold. So I just said, well, I'm going to do what you said. I just got in my car and drove out there to the house. Got out, walked up to the front porch, said, listen to me, I'm talking to you. Jesus said you would obey me. Somebody likes you. Somebody needs you. You'll be a blessing to somebody. They like the way your bricks are stacked. Went inside and talked to it. Call you sold in Jesus' name. Went down and talked to the other one. Now, I'd like to tell you it sold the next day, but it didn't. So two weeks later, I'm driving down. It's, it's cold that day. It's in the winter. And your carnal mind, see, begins to talk to you. My, my carnal mind said, uh, now what you going to do, big mouth? Now see, most of us think it's the devil talking to you. Most of it's a carnal mind. I said to the Lord one time, I, or said to a congregation one time, the devil said to me so-and-so. When I got back in the room, the Lord said, you said the devil said to you. Yeah. He said, let me ask you something. Did you resist him? I said, yes, sir. He said, well, he was fleeing from you. He wasn't even there. How could he talk to you? He said, that's your carnal mind. And uh, 
But anyway, my carnal mind said, now what are you going to do, big mouth? You've made all these statements. And I remembered something that the Lord said in one of our meetings through word of prophecy. He said, tears of self-pity and sorrow never release faith. He said, uh, learn to release your faith in laughter. So if you had faith as a seed, <laughs> so I just drove down there. It's cold that day. I just rolled the window down. Drove up to the house, stuck my head out and said, ha, ha, ha. Went down and laughed at the other one and went home. And don't look at me with that tone of voice. <laughs> Didn't you feel silly? Yeah, I did. But what's that have to do with it? I'm doing what Jesus said to do, what the Spirit of God impressed me to do. Now, I've talked to the mortgage, sold the ha two houses, sold the whole project, sold the land behind it, and the note was paid in full. I bought a, I bought a farm in 1973. That was, I'd confessed the word, I got a hold of this word of faith in 1969. Been confessing the word and confessing the word. And uh, one morning I was praying, I was farming at the time, and I said, now, Lord, I need some more land to farm, and I don't know where there's any land available, but I know you do. I ask you to cause it to come to me in Jesus' name. And then I see, I'd been doing some teaching on angels. I said, ministering spirits, go and cause the land to come to me in Jesus' name. Now, I'm, I, mentally, I'm thinking about renting the land, you see. Well, two weeks later, the phone rang one morning. And the, my landlady said, uh, I was working part of her land. She said, we're going to sell our farm. You want to buy it? I said, yeah, I'd like to buy it. In fact, I said, I'll come up and talk to you tonight and, and make the offer on it. I hung up the phone. And uh, my wife said, uh, what are you going to do? I said, I'm going to buy the farm. She said, what are you going to use for money? I said, money is no problem. <laughs> it came out of my spirit. And it really wasn't because I didn't have any. Yeah. So now here's what I'm talking about. You, you get yourself soaked in the Word of God and confess what God says. These things come right out of your spirit. A year before, I said, oh, no, dear God, I couldn't buy anything. I don't have any money. I knew it. You know. These things entering in. But you see, what's entering in now is what God said. There's abundance and no lack. I know it beyond any doubt. I don't know how it's going to happen. But anyway, I went up that night, figured what would be a fair price for the farm, offered $478,000 for the farm. And uh, they had a little caucus over it, and they said, well, now there's another fellow that, that he's indicated he might give $75,000 more than that. And he said, we, we'll have to wait and see what turns out. So on the way back home, I'm praying in the Spirit. See, Paul said, when you don't know what to pray for as you ought, the Holy Spirit, through your Spirit, makes intercession. So I'm praying in the Spirit. And, and another thing, when you pray in the Spirit, you become more sensitive to what the Spirit of God said. And I'm praying in the Spirit, and the Lord said to me right out of my own mouth, just as if I'd give prophecy, He said, you know who the, you know who the mountain is? Go speak to him, and he'll be removed. And I knew the fellow that, that was bidding against me on the farm. Now, how can you get any more scripture on that? He said, go talk to the mountain, he'll be removed. So I just drove right on out to the fellow's farm, and he was sitting on the fence out there where they were rounding up some cattle. And I said, you know, we're, we're both bidding on a farm, and I said, if we don't get together, it's going to cost one of us a lot of money. And he said, yeah, I know it. He said, I don't like the way they're shopping the, the, uh, my price. He said, I tell you what, if, if you, I don't really need the land. If you really want it, I'll just withdraw my bid. And he did. And they did. And I did. And uh, 
see, I had, I went over to the bank, talked to, to the Federal Land Bank, and they said, well, yeah, we, we, see, they didn't want all the money. They wanted only a third down or so much down. So I went by there, and they said, well, yeah, we had no, no problems with loaning that amount of money. So I thought I had the deal all sold up. Well, when I go over there and I tell them, okay, we're going to get the deal together, they said, well, well, how much is a second mortgage? And see, everybody I talked to said, well, you, can, you can't buy that land that way. I was going to give them a second mortgage, give the bank a first mortgage, and everybody said, you can't do that. But I did. Why? Because of what I believe. Everybody tried to talk, why you can't do that. If you could do that, if you could do that, anybody could buy the farm. But they agreed to it. Went by to talk to the banker again, and he said, well, you know, he said the second mortgage is too big. We can't loan that money. And I'm sitting there and praying in the Spirit, just under my breath. And I heard the Spirit of God say, go across the street to the bank. Well, I knew the fellow that run the bank over there, but I never done it. didn't even have an account there. And I thought, go across the street to the bank. Well, I just, you know, if you don't do the sayings of Jesus. You know what Mary said to the disciples about Jesus when they run out of wine? said, whatsoever he saith to you, do it. That's the way you get a miracle. I just got up and said, I, I, I'll be back in a little while going across the street. So I walked over and walked into the bank. The fellow said, well, how are you doing? What can we do for you? I said, I need to borrow $169,000. <laughs> I thought, might as well get to the point. <laughs> well, yeah, he said, I, I heard about that farm you bought. He said, uh, just bring the papers. We'll loan you the whole amount if you want it. And money was no problem. Now, of course, they didn't want that. I said, no, they don't want the whole amount. That's the whole problem, they, you know. And I explained to him, they was taking a second mortgage, and he could have a first, and everything worked out fine. Anyway, the, the, the land was purchased. Now, it took them six, eight months to get the, the uh, abstract up to date. By the time they got the abstract up to date, I had sold 40 acres of the land to the school district to build a new school on for $105,000. I had $57,000 profit in that one deal, and that gave me, by the time we closed the, the escrow, I had $57,000 equity in the farm and had not put one penny in it, not one. Money was no problem. Miracle after miracle after miracle. Like who was it? John Osteen wrote a book, There's a Miracle in Your Mouth. But you know, so many times there is defeat in people's mouth. But what I wanted to relate to you, and I, I don't want you to miss this, it took, first of all, the foundation of God's Word on the inside of me until I'm fully persuaded, and to the point I can believe what I'm saying will come to pass. I, I won't say it again. It won't happen just because you say it. But if you say and believe and doubt not in your heart, now that comes by confessing and saying what God says. That's why it's so important that we realize that this, this is not just a formula. This is a principle. Now, Mark 11, 20, 23 says, Whosoever shall say to the mountain, be removed. Notice it didn't say, say to the mountain, you're getting bigger. <laughs> but you have people that will say, well, you're not going to catch me talking to no mountain. I don't believe in that stuff. That name it and claim it bunch. That blab it and grab it. <laughs> well, now, if God named it, I'm going to claim it. But you see, just follow them around. They're talking to the mountain every day, but they're telling it it's getting bigger. You just always hinder me. I'll never get over you. We'll never get these debts paid. And they criticize you and me for saying the, the positive things, what God's already said about us. And they, some of them will even say this, well, you're just trying to act like God, saying what God said. Well, now, wait a minute. If I'm acting like God, saying what God said about me, who are they acting like when they say what the devil says about me? 
They are calling things that are not as though they were on the negative side. Well, you watch and see, we will not be able to make the payment on our house by the end of the year, and we're going to lose it sure as a world. What are they doing? Calling things that are not. They're using the same principle, but they're doing it in reverse. Well, I'd rather follow God, hadn't you? There was a lot that came available next door to our office, and, and I sold the land some years before to the fellow for $7,000 for two acres. And uh, he used an acre of it, or almost an acre, and built a, <laughs> he built a Dairy Queen on it. And uh, I tried to buy it back from him after we built the office there, and uh, he wouldn't sell it. But anyway, to make a long story short, uh, he sold it to another individual. For a while, I don't know, but didn't sell it to me. Well, this individual decided he's going to sell it, so he put it on the market. So I made offer on it. Before I made the offer, though, I, I, I took the word of God and I said, Now, Jesus, you said if I don't do your sayings, I'm going to fail in life. But if I do them, base it on the authority of the word. And I said, You said that if I speak to a sycamine tree, you said it would obey me. Problem area, situation. Here's a situation. This lot joins my property. I'm going to make them a reasonable offer on it. The reason I know it's reasonable is because it's several times more than they paid me for it. So I offered him $25,000 for the, for the acre and a third. But first of all, I went out there and walked around and I said, Now, Brown, listen to me. I'm talking to you and Jesus said you would obey me. I call you into the ministry in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. I lay hold on you by faith and you will come to me in Jesus' name. Are you listening to me? I am talking to you. Now, what do you suppose folks would have thought if they'd have found me out there doing that? That's what Jesus said to do. Say to it. See, we get to rationalize, well, how's that going to change it? You're obeying the words of Jesus, and if you want a miracle, do what he said to do. Well, they turned my offer down. Now remember, he, he paid $7,000 for two acres several years before. I've offered him $25,000 for an acre and a third. That's a pretty good offer. But he turned it down. So then my wife got an agreement. That's our land. Went to work one morning, some two months later. The real estate lady said, well, now you just keep in touch with me. She said, he'll eventually sell it for that. She said, I'll kind of keep tabs on it. Well, we went to work one morning, and there's a sign out there, Future Home of the Production Credit Association. I told my wife, I said, you see that sign on our lot? <laughs> she said, yeah, I saw that. <laughs> Boy, my, my, I'm reasoning, you know, I've got over into the carnal now. And in my head said, now what you going to do, big mouth? And, and it just bugged me for two or three days. I, I said to my wife, I said, honey, you reckon I ought to go talk to that fellow? And, uh, and then I, I got up one morning, and very often the Spirit of God speaks to me when I first get up. He'll say some things to me. I got up that morning, was walking through the hall. I remember exactly where I was, and, and my head was saying, Now what are you going to do about that property? And I just hollered out loud, came right out of my spirit. I know what I'll do. Nothing. <laughs> Jesus said it would obey me. And I've already spoken. I've already agreed. We've already agreed. It's my property in Jesus' name. I'm not doing one single thing. My corresponding action is no action at all. I believe God. Lying vanity, if you receive lying vanity, you forsake your own mercy. Well, I just went on and went fishing one day, having a dominion seminar. Dominion over the fish in the sea. I called in, and my wife said, that real estate lady's trying to get a hold of you. Wants to talk to you right away. So I called her. 
She said, are you still interested in that property? I said, yes, ma'am. Would you still give what you offered? I said, yes, ma'am. She said, well, you know, it's funny. They decided they're not going to build. They're going to build over on this other street. I said, I don't doubt it. <laughs> he shall have whatsoever he saith, if he believe, if he doubt not in his heart, if he believes what he is saying will come to pass. He shall have. Now, I, I was farming at the time. And I was dealing in real estate kind of on the side. I was out in Odessa, Texas, and my uh, friend of mine bought a piece of property out there on Interstate 20 and uh, built a church on it. And I'm out there looking at it. It's beautiful property. Right on the Interstate 20, ac paved access road down the whole frontage of the property uh, was access off each mile, uh, half mile on each side of it. And I was questioning him. I said, what did you have to pay for that property? Well, he said, $3,000 an acre. I said, you've got to be kidding. In Little Rock, Arkansas, they're getting $45,000 an acre for property on the freeway. And so I prayed about it. I felt led to buy a piece of it. So I found out, I just bought everything else they had there. They had 22 acres left. And, and see, when I prayed about it, I, like Brother Hagin said, I got that velvety feeling on the inside. And when you pray about something and think about it, and you get a knot in the pity of your stomach, don't do it. That's the red light. So I bought it. Paid them so much down and uh, was paying payments on it, and uh, I think at that time, 6% interest. So I kept it for a while. Several years, and if you know anything about real estate, you know you, you know things go up and go down, and and uh, after a while you, you you get tired feeding that alligator. You know you 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 pay an interest and it's not producing anything, and so I decided, well, I'm going to sell part of it, and uh, I did sell two acres of it, but for twenty five thousand dollars. But there was a fella called me, and, and, and he's interested in buying it, part of it. So we came to agreement, and I flew out there to sign the papers on 10 acres of it. Well, the morning before, the night before I got there, it came out in the paper and said they were going to annex it to the city, and that ground has caliche in it. It's a white rock, and if they annex it to the city, you have to put sewer, you have to put water in before they can build anything, and utilities, and that'd be prohibitive. So I got there, and I already had it surveyed and all of this, and the guy backed out. He said, I just can't afford to do it because uh, uh, I can't afford to put all these utilities in. Well, it kind of steamed me, you know. I, I, he was going to pay me like uh, $5,500 an acre for it. Well, I got to praying about it. And I'm praying in the Spirit, in tongues. And uh, I heard the Spirit of God say to me, you're selling it too cheap. I thought, selling it too cheap? Yeah, he said, double your price. I said, double my price? He won't even pay what I asked. <laughs> See, reasoning. And so, uh, so I doubled my price on it. I was teaching for a uh, seminar for Marilyn Hickey and, and, and uh, Wally out in Denver. And I was talking about, I was teaching about uh, the blessings overtaking you, if you, you, you know, what it says in Deuteronomy there, the 28th chapter, all these blessings come upon you and overtake you, and if you uh, hearken diligently with the voice of the Lord thy God. And when the session was over that morning, the phone rang, and they said, Brother Caps, it's for you. So I answered the phone, and it was that fellow that, that was trying to buy the property. He said, uh, well, we have good news, said, you know that that we got a deal with the city where they're not going to annex it to the city. And he said, you know, that property is worth twice what it was. <laughs> <laughs> but he said, we're not in position to pay that much for it yet. But, you know, so we went on. And uh, I kept it a couple more years, and, and I was out at Brother Hagin's camp meeting. And uh, I said to Joe Nave, minister friend of mine, I said, Joe, come go with me. I'm going to Odessa. He said, what are you going to Odessa for? I said, I'm going out there and talk to a piece of property. <laughs> he said, do, do what? <laughs> I said, it's time for it to sell. I'm going to go talk to it. I'm going to do what Jesus said. He said, I'd fail if I didn't. So we flew 300 miles to talk to this piece of property. Now, I, the fellow that carried us out there, uh, 
picks up the airport. I walk out there, and it's dry out there, you know, and the sagebrush stuff. And I walk across there, and I'd pick me up a handful of dirt, and I'd say, Listen to me, I'm talking to you. Jesus said you would obey me. I call you sold in Jesus' name. You're going to be a blessing to somebody. Somebody likes you. Somebody just can't do without you. I'd scatter it out and go get another handful and talk to it. And this guy sent over talking to Joe Nay. He said, what's he doing? Oh, he said, he's talking about ground. <laughs> no, oh, oh. He <laughs> said... Well, I'd like to say it's old the next day, but it didn't. Ten months later, I got a phone call from the same guy that turned it down, now $5,500 an acre, his partner. Well, we're interested in buying that ground now. We sold all that we had there and built buildings on it. And uh, anyway, to make a long story short, they paid $21,000 an acre for it. Now, somebody said, well, I tried that and it didn't work. It won't work if you try it. We're talking about doing the sayings of Jesus. Do you understand what I say? What I mean when I say you base what you do on the authority of God's Word. Don't do it because I did it. You get yourself in trouble. Do it because of the faith in God's Word. See, if you try to operate this when you only have the theory of it, it's not going to produce because you don't believe and you don't, you know, you don't believe what you're saying will come to pass. The way most people talk, most Christians talk, they better not believe what they say will come to pass. You know, they tickle, talk about tickle me to death, laugh the thought of die, dying to go, going to die if I don't. <laughs> and they don't really know what they're saying. I had a fellow, I, I was in the barbershop getting my hair styled. And <laughs> <laughs> what? Yeah, what are you laughing about? I know with the weather like it is, I can't do a thing with my hair. <laughs> This guy came in coughing and sneezing. Says, Well, I've been trying to take the flu for three weeks. <laughs> I thought, you know, if he'd been trying to take healing, he'd probably been well. Well, eating a hamburger one day. Two ladies talking. One of them said, Did you hear about so and so? She got her she had an operation on her foot and, and she's just tickled to death. <laughs> I heard she got her foot healed, and uh, yeah, she's just tickled to death. And in about three minutes, they said she was tickled to death about seven times. <laughs> and I thought, I wonder what they'd say if I said, isn't it a shame? Yes. She's got her foot healed, and now she's dead. <laughs> well, they wouldn't have had any idea what I was talking about. They didn't even know what they'd said. And don't try to straighten everybody out. <laughs> you get in trouble. <laughs> You'll learn that quick. <laughs> Some folks don't want to be straightened out. They want to do it the way they're doing it. But you see, all of these things that has been injected into our vocabulary is designed to keep us from believing what we say will come to pass. If you believe, if you doubt not in your heart, and if you believe what you're saying, not just what you said to the mountain, not just what you said to the sick man tree, but believe what you're saying will come to pass. He shall have what's every say it. And I believe that your body believes every word you speak. When I got a hold of this message, I, I was, uh, I liked the deer hunt. It looked like every tree that make a good deer stand had poison ivy all over it. And I, if I ever got around it, get all over me. And I'd get the calamine lotion, put it on, sit on, dry it up. But I got a hold of the message. I'm redeemed from the curse. My skin reacting to poison ivy has got to be part of the curse. Because everything written in the book, every disease that was listed in Deuteronomy, the 29th, 8th chapter, or 29th chapter, 
uh, was under the curse. And he said, all those that are not listed here are under the curse. And I'm redeemed from the curse. But my body didn't know that. So I said, well, thank God I'm redeemed from the curse. I'm delivered from the authority of darkness. I said, body, listen to me. I'm talking to you. Jesus said you would obey me. You do not respond to Paul's knife. You do not react. You have no adverse reaction to Paul's knife in Jesus' name. Well, I confess that for some time, you know. And the next time I got around it, guess what? That Paul's knife. <laughs> Well, you know, people say, well, that proves it doesn't work. No, no, faith is coming. The game's not over yet. I'm not trying it, I'm doing it. So I continued to say it, continued to say it. Got it again. Continued to say it. See, I'm not quitting. See, a trier would quit. After about a year, I noticed the next deer season, I didn't get any poison ivy. The next year, I didn't get any poison ivy. Now, I don't know how many years it's been. I've lost count of it. Never had a spot of poison ivy on me since then. It's been somewhere around 14, 15 years. The way I get the poison ivy off the trees now is that I cut it with a pocket knife at the bottom and strip it off with my hands. I don't advise you to do that unless you know you are redeemed from the curse. <laughs> totally persuaded, fully persuaded. But I see what happened. My body believed what I said. He shall have whatsoever he saith. If he believes, if he doubts not in his heart, and if he believes what he's saying will come to pass. It's not just formula. It won't happen just because you say it. But yet saying it is involved in setting it in motion. Now let me give you the difference in the formula and uh, the principle. When I was about, I think I was four years old, my brother was about seven. We were out one day and we watched the birds fly off the barn. And, and uh, my brother said, you know, if we had wings, we could fly. <laughs> And he said, you know what? He said, I'm going to make us a set of wings. <laughs> and said, we'll fly down to Junior's house. That's my cousin, my favorite cousin. You know, He lived about four or five miles away. <laughs> Boy, I'm all for it, you know. So he went in the house, and he came back in a little while, and he made a set of wings out of uh, some shoebox lids. <laughs> Now, the, to a, to a four-year-old, it looked like a perfectly good set of wings. <laughs> now, just from our observation, we could tell that all that the birds do is they kind of jump and they flop their wings. And they just fly away. <laughs> so that's all we got to do. But you see, they're, they're on the barn, so we think you got to get on the barn to do it. <laughs> so... Uh, my brother said, well, now, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to fly down to, to, to Billy Joe and Junior's house, and, and when I come back, you can go. <laughs> no, I want to go first. <laughs> oh, I mean, we had an argument. No, he said, it's my idea, and I'm going first. <laughs> okay, so I help him up on the barn. Now, the barn happened to be one of those low eaves and kind of steep roof, but the roof was about five or six foot high on one side. He started to try to climb to the top of the barn, but it's a steep, he decided he better not do that. So he gets up there and he, he, he's got these uh, shoebox lids strapped on with a, with a piece of string, you know. <laughs> and he jumps. And he hits thud. And I run over there, I called him Buddy. I said, Buddy, why didn't you flop your wings? <laughs> he was in there and said, I didn't have time. <laughs> now, we had the formula right. They jump and they flop their wings. <laughs> but we'd miss something. I said, let me have them. I know I can do it. <laughs> now, 
Now, brother, there was no doubt. I am fully persuaded. <laughs> But I am fully persuaded of assumption. I assume the wrong thing. You see, I'm believing in the formula. I don't have any idea about the principle. You see, this is where people miss it. Well, bless God, all you got to do is say it. No, there's something. There's more to it than that. You got to believe. You got to doubt not in your heart. Well, I, I was fully persuaded I could do it, but it was based on fa a fallacy. <laughs> It's got to be based on the Word of God. Well, he helped me up on the bar. Well, I got them wings all fixed just right, you know. Man, I can just see myself. We're going to fly down there and land on their bar. See. I guess we thought that's the only place you can land on the bar because that's where the birds are. <laughs> I get up there, and I had on a new pair of overalls, and they're about three inches long, too long. I had them rolled up, but by the time I've, you know, been walking around, they done down in my, dragging my tracks out. Well, on the top of that barn, there was these old square-headed nails, you know, those old nails they used to use? And they had worked up about that high as one of them that held the shingles on. And when I jumped, my breeches leg hung on a nail. And I had plenty of time to fall. <laughs> but I didn't fly. <laughs> my first flight was an inverted landing. You know, I mean, hanging. The worst thing about the whole deal is my aunt was out hanging out clothes. She's watching and listening to this whole deal. She had to come get me down off the barn. I had the formula, but I didn't have the principle. There's more to it than just the formula. It's what's in your heart. Faith works in the heart. It won't work in your head. See, there's a little power in uh, positive confession. But we're not talking about uh, mind over matter. We're talking about God's Word over all matter. We're talking about obeying the words of Jesus, doing the sayings of Jesus. And when you follow the ministry of Jesus, you see miracle after miracle after miracle. What did he do? Use this very principle. He operated under this very principle in all of his ministry. He talked to the wind, he talked to the sea, he talked to dead people, he talked to the fig tree, and they all obeyed him. And he said, if you come to me and hear my sayings, then do them. When the storms and the streams of life beat vehemently against you, they cannot shake you. I mean, the bad news goes in one ear and out the other, so to speak. I don't believe a word of it if it's contrary to the Word of God. I'm going to prosper regardless of what the economy does. Amen. I'm like that tree planted by the rivers of water. Amen. We were fishing one day, Brother Caldwell, Happy Caldwell and I. And uh, <laughs> first fish he caught broke his line. He said, what am I going to do? That's my favorite plug. I said, I don't know about you, but if it's me, I'd command him to spit it up in the name of Jesus. You have dominion over the fish of the sea. He looked at me and he said, well, all right. He turned around and said, fish, spit that up in the name of Jesus. Well, he went on tied on another plug and we fished on down the lake. He went down to the corner of the lake and turned and started up that way and about a hundred yards we'd fish. A little bit I heard a splash and turned around and looked and, and this fish then jumped up there in 20 yards of the boat and spit his plug out right there by the boat. I said, Brother Caldwell, there's your plug. He turned around and looked. He said, I see it and don't believe it. But you see, he didn't have to believe it then. He just had to believe it when he said it. That's just, he's actually just kind of 
making fun there. Well, you said, see it and don't believe it. But folks, the things that we say, I'm telling you, in everyday life, this is where Jesus wants us to use these principles. My dad, he's 84 years old right now, and uh, he still hunts deer with a bow and arrow and climbs trees, builds deer stands. You know, he just wear you out. <laughs> you know? But anyway, we were fishing one of those White River Lakes one day, and uh, he hung a bass around, and he run around a cypress knee, and you know, I, I go to some of these lakes, and they say, oh, you want to use a six-pound test line. I say, you've got to be kidding me. Where I go fishing, we use 25-pound tests, and you get your line broke three and four times a day, because when they wrap around that tree stump or something in one jerk, and they break your line. Anyway, he hung this big bass, and he broke his line, and he had on a purple Shannon spinner. He said, what am I going to do? He said, that is not purple bait, the only one he had. Well, he said, I know what I'll do. I'll come back. When I come back by here, I'll catch him and get it back. Now, what do you suppose the chances are of catching that same fish the same day and him having that bait in his mouth? You could have a computer printout that run from here to the parking lot out there, and you'd still have to go further to get the, the, the chances of that out. We fished on down the lake. An hour we came back, and about 50 yards from where he hung that fish, he caught him again. When he pulled him up, he had him hooked in the left jaw with a white spinner, and the purple one was in the right jaw. Somebody said, coincidence. No. He said, I'll catch him when I come back. Now, folks, those people fish a lifetime and never do that. When we begin to say what we believe and, and believe what we say, you fix to have some miracles happen. But now, see, the problem is that we've been taught wrong. I mean, back years ago, I was taught wrong. And maybe I wasn't taught some of it. Maybe I just assumed certain things, read between the lines, and got it wrong. And, you know, I thought you ought to just say it the way it is. And that's what people tell you. You just got to say it like it is. No, that's not what the Word says. The Word says say it the way God said it. See, it may be present fact in your life that there's lack, but it's not the truth. Jesus said, I am come that you might have life and have it more abundantly. If you have given, it is given unto you. Not going to be, as far as heaven is concerned, it is given. It's already set in motion. Now, you may not have it in your possession at this time, but heaven's already given it. But if you don't get your mouth in line with that, you may miss it altogether. There was people talked about that land deal. They're still talking about it in England, Arkansas. The farm I bought was the England estate. I live in England, Arkansas. The people that founded the town of England had this land in their uh, family for a hundred years. Nobody thought they'd ever sell it. When I went up there to sign the papers in St. Louis, the, the fellow said to me, he said, you know, we never intended to sell this land. Now listen to this. He said, the, uh, uh, the, the ladies, uh, my aunts and the older ladies, they wanted to sell it and get their money because there was so many grandchildren by the time they divided up at their death, they wouldn't have gotten much out of it. So they said, well, i tell you what to do. I want to keep it in the family. Y'all put it on the market, find out what it's worth, and I'll buy it and keep it in the family. But he said, you offered us so much money for it. He said, we can put the money in the bank and make a lot more money than we can off of the farm. But when I said, I will buy the farm, it changed the whole thing. They never intended to sell it. 
The farm was not for sale when I said that. Not to anybody outside. But you see, everything's subject to change with the Word of God. I'm glad I didn't know that. See, you're better off sometimes you don't know some things. But when, I fully, when you're fully persuaded, you see, here, here's the thing about it. God's Word produces the faith for the things that God's given you. Confessing the Word causes the faith to come. The Word is nigh you, it is in your mouth and in your heart. But when it's abundantly in your heart, the first stages of it doing very little to change the situation. I confessed abundance and walked in lack for a, nearly a year after I started confessing. But finally I was fully persuaded. When I became fully persuaded, things started to happen. I mean, a land deal would come across my path. Just, I mean, just looked like God just laid it in my lap. But that wasn't really, God wasn't that <laughs> excited about me. It was the Word being spoken that changed situations and circumstances. I could stay here and tell you stories from now till the sun came up in the morning. But I don't want you to believe in the stories that I'm, I'm talking about. I want you to believe in the Word of God. But folks, I'm telling you, we're dealing with God's holy word. And Jesus said, if you don't do my sayings, you're going to fail in life. And when you go to doing the sayings of Jesus, they're going to be folks that, like I said, they're going to give you lots of room. Because they don't understand this kind of thing. <laughs> it was a guy that we sold, a, everybody in England just about sold their cotton one year. Before they got it picked, you know, I mean, they thought it, uh, cotton got down to 14 cents one year, and uh, I think the next year it was up to 25, and they, it just about everybody sold their cotton. And the guy offered me 25 cents for mine, and I said, I had been praying about it. I said, well, let me pray about it. I prayed about it, and I heard the Spirit of God say, no, hold it. You'll get 34 cents. And so I just told the fellow, I said, no, nah, I want 34 cents for mine. And he laughed and laughed and laughed at me. But two months later, I got 34 cents for mine. We were sitting in the, in the coffee shop there one morning, and, and there was a fellow smoking a cigar, and he said, hey, I want to know how it is that you held your cotton and we all sold ours. How come you didn't sell yours when we sold ours? I said, because my financial advisor advised me against it. <laughs> He said, he used the word I won't use here. He said, who is your financial advisor? I said, his name is Jesus. And he liked to swallow his cigar. <laughs> I finished harvesting my rice. Now, see, the reason I'm telling you this, folks, the people get the idea this only works in spiritual things. Folks, this is what God wants us to use in everyday life. This word works. It creates an atmosphere of God's holy word, creates an atmosphere in you that's fit for God to live in. He said, if you abide in me and the words abide in you, Jesus said, ask what you will. And he said, if you keep my words, we will come and make our abode with you. It's not that God's all that struck on me or anybody else. It's his word that he honors. Finish my rice, harvest rice. And... Uh, the fellow said, hey, the rice gone up today, 20 cents. I can get you $3.60 a bushel today. And the guy, that was another fellow there with me, he just finished his. He said, sell mine. Yeah, that's a good price. Sell it. Sell it. He said, what about you? I said, well, I'm going to pray about it. Oh, you know. So I'm praying about it. Thank God I have the wisdom of God. See, I'm confessing I have the wisdom of God. I have the mind of Christ. I hear the voice of the good shepherd, the voice of a stranger I will not follow. And I, I asked the Lord about it. I said, now, Lord, what will I do? I, I ask you for wisdom. James 1, 
Five said, if you lack wisdom, ask it, and he'll give to you. Liberally upbraid not, shall be given. But let him ask in faith, nothing waver. He that wavers like a wave of the sea, driven wind, tossed, let not that man think he'll receive anything of the Lord. So I'm thanking God for it, just driving down the road one day, minding my own business, and I heard the Spirit of God say, don't sell it, hold it. So I just called the fellow and said, no, I'm going to hold it. Now, that was September, right upon September. In January, I sold it for nine dollars and three cents a bushel. And you know, it reminded me of something Paul said: the manifestation of the Spirit is profitable to every man with all. <laughs> what happened? Had a manifestation of the Spirit. Why? Because of the Word, and it was profitable. These are the things that, that so many times people miss. They think, oh, this is just talking about spiritual things. And I could go on and on and on. Every piece of property that I've bought and sold in the last 10 years, I talked to it. Got to tell you one more story. Well, how long have we been here? Dear goodness. Then my wife went up to central, north central Arkansas in the Greer's Ferry Lake. And we was flying over this mountain, and she said, I'd sure like to have a lot on this mountain. Well, we'll go check on it. So we went up there a few days later and drove out there and got to asking about it. Oh, they said that, you know, that mountain belongs to the timber company, and they'll never sell it. I said, that's subject to change. <laughs> So we went out there and walked around on it, picked up the dirt, and talked to it. Jesus said, you would obey me. I call you and tell you to come to me in Jesus' name. A few days later, I walked into the courthouse and to file a deed. I bought a little piece of property over on the other side of the lake. And I asked them about somebody that owned a certain park of the mountain, and they said, well, there he comes in the door right now. I just walked in the door. So I introduced myself and asked him about it. Well, no, he said that property is not available, but he said there's a, there's a piece of property that has just become available. Ten days after we talked to it, it came on the market. Now, how more scriptural can you get? It says, Jesus said, whosoever shall say to the mountain, be removed. Well, I just said, Come to me. Don't be removed. Come to me. <laughs> well, now I've talked enough. Dear goodness, there's no, play, there's no end to this. You realize that, don't you? <laughs> but at least, you know, I haven't preached as long as Paul did. <laughs> The 19th chapter of Acts, it says he entered into the synagogue and spake boldly for the space of three months. <laughs> well, not quite that long, has it? Do you understand what we're talking about here? Folks, I'm telling you, you can change any situation with the Word of God. But the, the, the key to it is getting it in your heart. The word is nigh you, it is in your heart and in your mouth. What you're speaking determines what you're going to believe. And Jesus said, in Matthew 22, 21, he said, All things, whatsoever you ask in prayer, believing, you shall receive. <laughs> so you're only limited by what you can believe. And you know what limits what you believe is what you say. That actually determines what you're going to believe. Because if you don't believe it when you start saying it, if you say it long enough, you'll go to believe in it. That's the reason we shouldn't say things that we don't believe. Because many a businessman has killed his own fig tree by prophesying, I tell you, nobody could make a living out of this business. We're going broke, sure as the world. They didn't really mean it.